Good morning. My name is Dr. Susan Allen Gill. I'm a professor in the Environmental Studies and Sciences Department at Ithaca College. I've been involved in the sustainability curriculum development at Ithaca College for several years. And as part of that uh, group and our efforts to develop curriculum on sustainability, I thought I would talk a little bit today about climate science and climate action because, as we all know, climate change is a big part of sustainability of the human environment, human populations, and the natural environment. What I'd like to do today uh, on the climate science part is talk about four specific things. The first one is detection. How do we know that climate change is happening? Two, attribution, or what causes climate change. Three, a quick review of the rates of change and the types of effects that we're seeing. And four, what public perception is of climate change. All of this figures into how we develop policy in relation to climate change at both the uh, national and international level. So to start off with detection, how do we know that climate change is happening? What are the types of information that scientists collect to piece together the picture of climate change? Well, there are several types of physical measurements that can be made. One are ice cores, and you've probably heard about those taken from Greenland. Here's a picture of an ice core. In this, we can look at the trapped air bubbles and determine how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere at any given time in prehistory. We can also do the same thing with sediment cores in lakes. And the third technique that we have are surface temperatures, uh, and the most famous place for collecting most of those temperatures is in Hawaii, and this is the atmospheric station in Hawaii that collects uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Here's another way you can tell that global warming is happening. Our underwear is getting smaller. Now let's look at temperature changes on two scales. This top graph here shows you the past 140 years, and if this is the average over that whole time, this line shows you the temperature in any given year. And you can see very clearly that we've gone from the 1860s to the 1940s, where the temperatures were lower, from the 1940s onward to 2000, where most of the temperatures have been above the average for that whole time period. You can also see that the change has not always been consistent. So there, has been, there was a little dip in here in the 19. Uh, 60s to 1980s, and that's because climate is caused by a variety of factors all playing into the same uh, endpoint of surface temperature. If we look at a longer time frame on the bottom scale here, the past thousand years in the northern hemisphere, you can see again that the temperatures, if this is the average over that whole time period, you can see that just recently, between say 1900 and uh, 2000 is when the temperatures started to increase significantly over uh, the past long distance record. This is a thousand years worth of data here. So what is causing this? You hear a lot about carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and so how much, how much of it is caused by carbon dioxide? How much of it is caused by humans? Or is this just a natural phenomenon in the cycle between ice ages and periods of uh, warmer weather? In this figure here, I'm showing you four different uh, uh, chemicals that occur in the environment. This is carbon dioxide. And you can see that it was fairly low and stable. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was fairly low and stable into the, until the invention of the internal combustion engine when we started burning oil, and then it shot up dramatically. The same applies for nitrous oxide. It was fairly steady for a long time, and then just recently has shot up. Methane concentrations follow the same pattern. And the sulfate aerosols, uh, as a result of all of the uh, atmospheric emissions, also say, show the same kind of trend. So yes, it's carbon dioxide, but it's also nitrous oxide and methane. So the question became, becomes, which of these gases are most responsible for the increase in, in uh, global temperature and why? In this figure, what I'm showing you is a bunch of different greenhouse gases carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. 
And their pre-industrial concentrations, the concentrations in 1998, how long they live in the atmosphere. And in this far column, we've got the global warming potential. Or what's their ability to capture heat? So if we look at carbon dioxide, you can see that the concentration has increased from pre-industrial levels to 1998. Um, I know that data is a little old, and it's much higher than 365 right now. We use this as the standard of having a, a global warming uh, potential of one and standardize everything against that value. So you can see that methane is 23 times more effective at capturing heat than carbon dioxide. But the concentration is much lower in the atmosphere. And it, uh, the extent, it doesn't have a very long uh, half-life in the environment. Nitrous oxide, again, much more potent. 296 times more potent, more able to capture uh, temperature, trap heat as carbon dioxide, but the concentrations are much lower and the resonance time is not all that long. There are some very, very potent greenhouse gases that we should worry about. Sulfur hexafluoride, for example, 22,000 times better at capturing heat than carbon dioxide. Fortunately, the concentrations in the environment are very low. If you look over here, you can see that one pound of sulfur hexafluoride equals the same amount of heat trapping potential as 11 tons of carbon dioxide. This is why the state of California banned sulfur hexafluoride in 2010. Now the next question becomes, OK, you've convinced me that these gas concentrations are going up in the atmosphere and that they are able to trap heat. But aren't there natural sources that are trapping heat? Aren't there natural reasons why the climate is changing? And what I'm showing you in this graph is the temperature over the year and trying to separate out the human-induced effects versus the natural effects. So if all we were looking at were natural effects like the uh, uh, explosion of volcanoes and other ways in which carbon dioxide gets emitted to the atmosphere or in methane, you, the, the temperature would do something like this. It would be variable so with, some, with some increases and decreases, but when we add on the human effects, the amount of carbon dioxide primarily, nitrous oxide and methane that are be being released to the environment, the changes are up here. What does this mean for the future? This is where we are now. A number of different scenarios could take place. This depends upon what we decide to do. If we decide to limit carbon dioxide emissions, then we might be able to do the low growth model. If we do nothing and carry on as business as usual, then you would expect us to follow the, the uh, line, the trajectory that we are currently on. So when people talk about we're not sure how much carbon dioxide is going to be in the environment later or what the warming is going to be over time, it's because we're not really sure which policies we're going to implement or how much carbon dioxide we're going to be releasing into the future. Now let's talk about what are the rates of change and what are the effects that we're seeing. Some of you are probably all too familiar with these already. It's getting hotter. Participation patterns are ch changing, sea levels rising, glaciers are melting, there's more extreme weather, greater spread of disease, and changing home ranges for many species. This is Hurricane Sandy, one of the largest storms that the United States has experienced in anybody's, uh, anybody's personal memory. And this is the extent of damage that Hurricane Sandy caused. People are now becoming very worried that if we do nothing about climate change and we expect more Hurricane Sandys, this is going to drive the U.S. and the global economy straight out of business because we can't afford storms like this frequently. The glaciers are melting. This is 1960. This is 2000. This is the total amount of ice that's held in glaciers around the world. And if we, if we start as this as a baseline, we have lost 
about 2,500 cubic meters of glacial ice over 40 years, 45 years. The glacier melting is important because uh, the, the on-land glaciers are resulting in an increase in sea level rise. So any of the uh, mountain glaciers are melting and causing an increase in the sea level rise. And then there's the glaciers that are a part of Antarctica or uh, Alaska that you see calving off, which also add to the, um, add to the, uh, or they take that back, they decrease the amount of uh, reflection of sunlight back into the atmosphere, which causes a positive feedback loop with more earth warming because the earth overall is darker instead of white and that causes a greater absorption of uh, energy. This is a view of the North Pole from above. Here's Greenland, here's Canada. And the line, this purple line right here is the median amount of sea ice in September for all data from 1979 to 2000. What you see in white is how much of the sea ice there was in the year 2007. 2007 was the year uh, of all the years on record that had the lowest amount of sea ice in the Arctic. It looks like 2012 is the second lowest amount of sea ice that we've had on the Arctic. This poses a big problem in terms of, uh, for critters like polar bears that need that sea ice for their survival, for their hunting platform, and other, uh, other, all the biota that live in the Arctic region. With all of the melting of the glaciers, we're likely to see an increase in sea level rise. And again, this is what we've seen from uh, about 1875 up to 2000. We've seen a slight increase in sea level rise. We could expect to see another uh, significant change. And again, we're not really sure how much it's gonna happen, which is why that's a fairly broad range. If a six meter increase in sea level rise is experienced, this is what we would expect to see in the Northeast. You can see a huge amount of loss of land across the entire eastern seaboard. It also affects many animals. In this diagram, what I'm showing you is the winter uh, residence of different birds. And so at, the, at here, this is where it used to reside. This is the Virginia rail. This is where it used to reside in the winter. It's now moved its winter residence to here. So generally, you can see that the pattern is that all of these bird species are moving their winter habitats further north. It's also affecting farming. The hardy zones, many areas have increased by one degree in winter. And what's that, what's that, what that has done is shifted our growing zones and pushing them further north. So these are the growing zones that the USDA uses. In 1990, these were the growing zones. Um, and in 2004, they had to rearrange the map to express what types of plants could grow in what types of zones. And you can see, for example, that things that used to only grow in the southern part of Texas and Florida have moved up to northern Florida. And things that used to grow primarily in Georgia are now able to grow in Virginia. If we move to some very recent data, this is 2012 for the United States. And what this is looking at is the temperature for each different month plotted against uh, the departure from the 20th century average. This black line is 2012, significantly warmer than any other year on record. And so for the uh, months before December, because here we are still in December, the national average temperature was 57.1 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit above the, 2000, uh, the 20th century average, and one degree above the previous warm record for January to November uh, that was set in 1934. So depending upon what happens in December, we're halfway through December right now. In order to not have it be the warmest record 
on uh, warmest year on record by far, we would have to have a December that was one degree colder than the coldest December that we've ever had in the United States. That's not happening, at least in my experience right here, right now. It's 40 degrees out here in Ithaca, New York today. Again, very recent data. This is the precipitation map for the United States for November. 62% of the contiguous United States was experiencing moderate, moderate to exceptional drought. I like this figure, one, because it's pretty, but two, because it describes the types of effects that we're likely to see at different increases in global temperature. So here we are, 2007, if we increase one degree, the types of changes that we're expected to see are decreased water availability, increased drought in many regions, Increased wildfire risk, we saw a lot of that this uh, last summer in the um, western part of the United States. Increased flood and storm damage, that's referring to events like Hurricane Sandy. Increasing burden for malnutrition, diarrhea, cardiorespiratory, and infectious diseases. Incidences of infectious diseases such as dengue fever are increasing throughout the tropics, again following the predictions that we would expect at the degree of climate change that we're seeing currently. If we get two degrees hotter, we expect to see increased rates of extinction for 20 to 30 percent of known species. Most of our coral reefs will be bleached, and there will be increased mortality from heat, floods, and droughts. If we go up to three degrees warmer, which we might expect to see in the 2050s, which is within the lifetime of many of the people currently living on this planet, we should expect to see major changes in, natu in natural systems causing predominantly negative consequences for biodiversity, water, and food supplies. The corals will experience widespread mortality and millions of people will face flooding risk every year. Looking out to the far future, say the 2080s or 2100, we would expect to see, an, if we have experience an increase of four degrees Celsius, we expect to see the extinction of more than 40% of known species. Global economic losses will, resu will result up to 5% of the global uh, gross domestic product. And the most of, or at least part of Greenland, the Antarctic ice sheets uh, will be melting, causing a, a drastic increase in sea level between 13 and 20 feet. Does the public care? What's the public perception about the state of climate change? Well, at least some people are feeling like it's worth protesting about. In uh, 2010, the Pew Research Center took, uh, took a, uh, conducted a poll. The Pew Research Center conducted a poll looking at the priorities of the American public with respect to uh, national spending. You can see that only 20% of the U.S. population thought that uh, global warming should be a top priority for 2010. This fell below every other category that was available to comment on. It, resents, it represents a 2% drop from the same poll conducted a year, a year earlier and a 10% drop from 2007. So what are we going to do about the climate change that we're experiencing? Well, I'm dividing this section into three different parts. One is mitigation. How can we stop pumping so many greenhouse gases into the environment? I'll talk about a number of options there. Second thing I want to talk about is adaptation. How can we adapt to a warmer world? And third, I want to talk about policy that's uh, currently underway both at the national and the international level. So in this figure, what we're looking at is the difference between mitigation and adaptation and where they play into the climate change framework. Here we have emissions and concentrations of greenhouse gases resulting in climate change. The climate change is going to impact human and natural systems. Adaptation 
is how we change our human and natural systems in response to the climate change that we're experiencing. The human and natural systems interact with our development paths, our technology, our governments, our policy forming. Adaptation feeds both ways here. In other words, we can adapt through uh, population and governance to reduce our impact on human systems, or our adaptation can be changes in policy. Mitigation is using our socioeconomic uh, systems to reduce the amount of emissions of greenhouse gases. So how could we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted to the environment? Do we have the technology to do it? How would we develop a policy? One of the preeminent ways to look at this is, is uh, through the development of wedges uh, that pro project out into the future. So in this graph, this is the carbon dioxide in billions of tons emitted per year. This is over time. This is what the increase that uh, has happened historically. This is the current path. If we wanted to stabilize carbon dioxide emissions where they are and have a flat path, we would end up with a triangle here. This triangle represents the expected increase of carbon dioxide emissions over the current level out into the future. Right here on this axis, you can see that that's a difference of 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide. What if we divided that stabilization triangle into seven wedges? So each wedge represents 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide emitted in the year 2054. Do we have the technology to reduce, to take this amount of carbon dioxide out of the, out of, uh, the emissions projections by 2054? How could we do that? Are there seven different ways that we could reduce 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Sure. There's lots of ways that we can reduce carbon dioxide emissions from the atmosphere. So in this, this is a, a projection of different types of changes that we could make to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. So you can see here that if we increase fuel efficiency, this large magenta triangle, we can reduce uh, uh, it by 24%. Other options include um, switching to different fuels, using renewables, using more nuclear power, and these two top ones refer to carbon uh, capture and sequestration, which I'll talk about in a minute. My point here is that we have the technologies to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that were being emitted into the environment so that the levels that we would be admitting in 2054 are no different than they were in 2004. I know this is a pretty difficult uh, figure to understand, but there's basically a couple of uh, points to get out of here. On the y-axis is the cost of any given strategy. So the most expensive cost would be to retrofit gas plants to capture carbon. The least expensive cost is to switch to LED bulbs in residential settings. It actually has a payback, which is why, a, a very quick payback, which is why it's a negative cost. The width of any given uh, entry on this graph refers to how much uh, it's going to help reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So using this uh, graph, we can look at what is the relative cost of different options that we have and how much good is it going to do. So you're looking for wedges on this graph that are wide and don't have very much cost. So for example, uh, here. Efficiency improvements of other industries. If we improve the efficiency of our in industries, it has a negative cost and actually uh, has a fairly high abatement potential. Let's look at sequestration. Sequestration means that we're developing techniques 
to capture the carbon that would otherwise be emitted to the environment before we release it to the environment. We can do this in lots of different ways. We could pump it into abandoned oil and gas wells. We could pump it into the deep ocean. We could plant more trees. We could make artificial trees, which is what this, di this middle diagram is over here. Or we could use algae digesters or biosequestration in order to capture the carbon dioxide that's in the environment. These are just five different strategies that people are working on quite intensively to figure out if we can uh, pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it uh, somewhere, whether it's an abandoned oil and gas well or deep into the ocean, to prevent its effects when it's in the atmosphere. Two political strategies that we could use to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are uh, based on economics. The first one is cap and trade, and the second one is a tax. So you'll often see both of these talked about with respect to developing policy for, for climate change and uh, reduction of CO2 emissions. The idea between cap and trade is that we say we make a total amount of carbon dioxide that we're going to be allowed to be emitted into the environment in any given year. We cap that. Then we develop credits or permits to be able to release that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And those, uh, those permits we could decrease over time so that the cap goes down. We could take those permits out of circulation, if you will, to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The EPA currently uses this approach for sulfur dioxide and it's really been quite successful. So the idea is that if you really want to uh, release carbon dioxide, you're going to have to pay to do it. And it's going to be a market-driven process where the, the cost of the permits depend upon the willingness of industry to pay to keep releasing carbon dioxide. It uh, has been talked about as part of the US government policy for some time. And, uh, one of the questions is, if we were to go that route, how would we decide who gets permits to pollute and who doesn't? So in uh, this figure from the House Energy and Commerce Committee several years ago, this is how they envision dividing up the permits for carbon dioxide releases. So regulated electric utilities would get 30%. Coal would get 5% of them. Natural gas and home heating oil would get 10% of them. Energy intensive trade exposed industries, in other words, those industries that uh, provide uh, uh, a positive balance of trade for the United States would get 15%. Oil fineries, refineries would get two. Renewables would get 16. And only a very small amount of the permits, 15%, would be available for auction. So it becomes pretty tricky to figure out who gets the credits to begin with, and what are we going to have as the base price for, say, one ton of carbon dioxide release? A different approach is to tax carbon, in which, in this case, instead of having it be a capped uh, amount that's released every year and have a permit system, it would be that uh, every, uh, every unit of carbon dioxide that you release gets taxed. There's no option for trading. Um, it, and it, being a tax, it could add to the federal revenues, and the cost uh, per ton of carbon dioxide could change over time. The federal government could say, you know, the tax rate is now 5%. Now it's 10% for the amount of carbon dioxide that you're um, using. Uh, the Canada and the, and the United Kingdom have been considering this type of approach, to my knowledge. Uh, it hasn't been adopted by any... Uh, by any country yet. There are some smaller uh, governmental entities that have adopted it. So this is, those are the mitigation strategies we have. We can reduce the amount of carbon dioxide through various technological or energy efficiency strategies. We can sequester the carbon dioxide that's in the environment already by making artificial trees, planting more trees, sending it down into the abandoned oil wells, putting it in the deep ocean, using algae to scrub the air. We can use a cap and trade system to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we're emitting. Or we can add a tax and hope that, that 
that, that is a disincentive for the release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Our other option or strategy is to adapt to the climate change that we can expect to happen. This becomes pretty controversial because many of the places globally that are going to have to adapt to changes in climate change uh, mo more quickly and more abruptly are not the countries that have been historically releasing the amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So who pays for the adaption costs of some countries, the countries that are going to experience those problems or the countries that have put, put the most carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is in the area called uh, climate justice. Currently, adaptation strategies are part of the UN framework for climate change. And uh, currently, every country is coming up with their national adaptation plans where they identify national priorities in these six areas, in agriculture, their coastlines, their ecosystems, their energy production, human health, and water resources. The idea is that once every country prioritize, uh, prioritizes their adaptation plans, then we can figure out how, uh, which of these to fund with a global adaptation fund. One of the countries that uh, is struggling to adapt to climate change and poses a very difficult problem for, for uh, the global humanity is the country of Tuvalu, which is a, a small island that is very close to sea level. And um, they may well not have a place to live by 2100. What could their adaptation strategy be? Find another place for their country to stay? Currently, uh, Tuvalu is experiencing uh, climate change such that the uh, ocean water is penetrating into the groundwater and causing uh, all, of their, uh, ground, all of their drinking water to become uh, too salty to be useful. Where do we stand from a policy perspective? Most people know about the Kyoto Protocol. And what I want to talk about right now is just some of the uh, uh, more recent in the last three or four years, changes to the uh, international policy uh, negotiations uh, post-Kyoto Protocol. On the national level, we've been pretty apathetic. I showed you that Pew Center research that the public doesn't really care. And in fact, climate change was not mentioned in any of the four presidential, official presidential debates. And it wasn't until his uh, President Obama's first speech after being reelected that he mentioned climate change at all. And this is what he said. What we do know is the temperature around the globe is increasing faster than it was predicted even 10 years ago. We do know that the Arctic ice cap is melting faster than was predicted even five years ago. We do know that there have been an extraordinary large number of severe weather events here in North America, but also around the globe. So this one, if one reads into this comment, it seems that Obama is ready to put climate change back on the national agenda. Internationally, one of the biggest uh, uh, climate change conventions since Kyoto Protocol was in 2009, where they came up with the Copenhagen Accord, in which major developing countries would subject to voluntary emission cuts subject to international scrutiny. This includes uh, particularly countries like China, India, and Brazil that were not part of the Kyoto Protocol in the, when it was first envisioned because their releases of carbon dioxide were fairly low. It also doesn't include the United States because the United States never ratified the Kyoto Protocol. In terms of adaptation, 2009 was the first year in which we started to talk about um, developing a fund for, to pay for adaptations globally. So the industrialized world would mobilize $100 billion in climate aid for poor nations by the year 2020. The problem with these uh, types of statements is they're not necessarily binding. 
And so there's nothing to hold countries to putting that money into that fund for adaptation for poor countries, for example. Particularly if the United States e economy is in a recession, they're not likely to want to pay up for poor countries uh, to adapt to climate change. In 2010, the same climate convention was in Cancun. And it, at this time, the nations agreed to create a green climate fund, to create research centers to, cl to develop clean energy transfer of technology from uh, the countries that have developed the clean energy technology to, to countries that, didn't ha that don't have it yet, and a system to pay developing countries for keeping rainforest attack intact so that we can use rainforest as a mitigation strategy. These agreements, however, did not spell out exactly how the new pot of international aid will be funded. In other words, it doesn't say which countries are going to have to donate X amount of dollars into the Green Climate Fund. And it did not determine if the Kyoto Protocol, developed initially in 1997, would be extended once its first commitment period expires in 2012. So here we are sitting at the end of 2010 with no idea of what the future uh, international policy with respect to climate change is going to look like. Some countries want to see the Kyoto Protocol extended. Some, people's wanna, uh, some countries want to abandon it altogether and develop something new. The UN uh, just completed its last round of climate change talks uh, on December 8th. And uh, some of the outcomes of, of those talks that were held in Qatar include that they established for the first time that rich nations should move towards compensating poor nations for losses due to climate change. This sounds pretty much like what we did in 2009 and 2010, with at least $10 billion a year until 2020. This is pretty much along the lines of the $100 billion fund that was talked about in 2009. Um, they also struck a deal that they would extend the Kyoto Protocol to 2020 because it was just about to expire in 2012. The problem with this extension is that it only covers less than 15% of the total climate change uh, greenhouse gases that are emitted because China, Brazil, and the United States, among others, are not covered currently under the Kyoto Protocol. The last thing that they d decided was that they would figure out how to implement something after 2020, whether it's a revision of the Kyoto Protocol or something else by 2015. So there's pressure on the international community in the next three years to figure out a system to take us beyond 2020 to reduce carbon dioxide emissions globally. So I hope that gives you a quick very quick, very fast introduction to climate science and climate action as it might play into global sustainability efforts. Thank you very much.